Uh, I thought one of, I have so many things swinging around in my head. Basically, some points that I would like to make um, this morning is to apply, one, some of what Nina was saying to the world of public libraries, and I'm sure when she was talking, you were already beginning to see some of the connections, and I want to tell you a little bit about some of the connections we've made at the Santa Cruz Public Library. And then I also want to talk about public libraries partnering and collaborating with museums, because we can take the principles that Nina was talking about and apply them to our relationships, um, to our colleagues, because the museum staff are our colleagues. They're going through the same kind of change, radical change, that we are, because we know that we are leaving the public library buildings too and needing to go out in the community and meet with people and find out what they need and be there where they are. Yes, we welcome them into our communities and we've got things on the shelves for them to check out, but there's a whole lot of other ways we want to connect with them. So I thought I would start with some of um, examples. I'm the luckiest duck in the world to be a public librarian in the same town with Nina in the museum. So this is not a bad thing. This is great. I, wanted, I heard some people talking at the break about the pop-up museums. I wanted to give you an idea of some of the things that the library has done with the pop-up museum. One of the most successful ones, um, Nora came to one of the friend's book sales. This is a really easy thing to do, but this is really popular. And set up the pop-up museum. We told people ahead of time that we were doing it, and they would bring in altered books that they had made. So maybe they had bought the book at a friend's book sale, or maybe they just had one. Um, and they've done something to it, they've changed it, they've engaged in uh, some kind of wonderful artistic transformation. So we had an altered books pop-up museum during the Friends book sale. And we were out in the parking lot, and we just, one of the tables, that's what we were doing. It was very popular, and a lot of people came, and then they went scurrying off to find some used books <laughs> that they could turn in to altered books. So that is one idea that I know works, does not take a lot of time, and to answer some of those questions about staff, the community and the friend, your friends group would get really interested in this. This is something you could really do without a whole lot of people. I do want to tell one other story. Nina was talking about um, taking books apart uh, during some of the art projects. I was involved in an art project. Stacy called me and said, um, every year, every year the museum does a book arts festival. And she said, will you come and participate? And I said, oh, sure, of course. What do you want me to do? And she said, well, I have an idea, but you, can you bring some used books. Can you bring some books for friends? Yeah, yeah, we can send some over. What do you want me to do? And she said, well, I'll, I'll show you when you get here. <laughs> and I trusted her. And um, I think it was her idea, Emily, because I remember both Stacy and Emily being there, but they got this fabulous idea. If you've ever seen stucco being constructed, it has an infrastructure of metal that looks something like chicken wire, except it's sturdier so that it has holes in it and everything. And so they made this cylinder of this um, chicken wire, and then they dropped tiny, tiny white LED lights in the middle of it. And I thought, what am I going to do with this? So I got there, and they had all the used books out, and they said, okay, all you have to do is tear a page out of the book, and you roll it up into a cone, and you stick it in one of those openings. And when you fill all the openings, you're going to have this great lighted sculpture. I said, oh, all right, I can do that. 
And exactly what Nina talked about happened. So the first, so I'm standing there waiting to do, to do this, and I've got the books all out. And people came up and said, you mean you want me to tear a page out of the book? <laughs> and I said what I never thought I would say. I said, yes, I'm a librarian, and it's OK. <laughs> and they said, oh, all right. So I had all this power. I had no idea. So, and, and people would come up, and they would say, tear a book out of the page. And somebody would point to me and say, yeah, she's a librarian. She said it was OK. <laughs> the only funny thing that happened there was when um, somebody came up with a book, and I couldn't see the title. And, and I said, I can't tear a page out of this book. I can't even believe you have this book here. And I thought, oh my gosh, I hope we didn't bring a Bible or something. What did we have? And it was a book about the Beatles. <laughs> and she just couldn't deal with it. So <laughs> I put it away for a later crew. But we, but, and it ended up beautifully. Uh, that, what I want to say is really work with your museum. Even if you have a tiny one-person museum in your town, work with that person. That person is one of your colleagues. There's so many different things you can do. And I know one of the questions was uh, online presence and what you can do. You can work with individual researchers, too. There's um, a woman in Santa Cruz who is both a geologist and um, a local historian. And she has a mobile app called Ranger, um, mobile, mobile Ranger. Ranger. And the library participates in that just by giving access to our local photographs. And she credits us on that app. And we don't do anything but be available to her and app developers like her to be able to present local history in another venue online. Look for things like that. Look for people like that. Um, the other program that I wanted to talk about that's online is War Inc. I know a lot of you know about War Inc. and all the work that Chris Brown has done with that. Uh, two of the veterans in the War Inc. exhibit are from Santa Cruz County. Uh, I am waiting for Nina to decide she wants to do something with tattoo art and we are there. We've got people, we know, we know what we can do, and we're ready to go. So be open to that kind of thing. They're really, museums are going through the same thing we are in that, to connect with their communities. I don't, you, I don't know if you even realize that, Nina. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and I just want to say about I think it's so clear from hearing Janice talk that, you know, people always ask what makes a good collaborator, and um, I always say, you know, it, it doesn't matter what kind of organization they're from, it just matters, you know, are they, are they game? Are, you know, we often say we have a three meeting rule that if it takes three meetings before we can do anything together, it's not going to happen. But you can hear from how Janice talks, Janice is somebody you can call and she will always say, Yes, and, um, and it sounds like you'll show up without even being told and, what's going to happen, right. which I didn't even right. know, which it's is amazing. Actually, <laughs> it's actually an easier way to get me there, <laughs> is not to tell me, and then I'll show up, and then, then we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, I think, I think uh, the other thing that we have in common that I wanted to point out is that we're very locally oriented both the public library and the museums are locally oriented. We have, some of you may have heard of a, a database that we have in Santa Cruz that was uh, constructed by Diane Cohen and our IT uh, staff, where we have uh, selections of music that can be streamed from local musicians, people who self-identify as Santa Cruz musicians. And you can go on to our site, and you can hear some of their music, and maybe find some music for your wedding or for your event. In our case, when we do YouTube videos, we go through our collection and find soundtrack. That's another good example of how we can be um, locally oriented, how similar this is to so many of the things that the museum does. 
So I think we mostly wanted to use this time to open it up for more conversation with all of us. We now have a museum and a library person sitting up here and a whole lot of great people and great ideas in the group. So I think we just want to open it up. And I don't know if uh, Karen, if you're available to help us, awesome. Um, and we can take the conversation wherever you guys want to go. And it looks like there's one over here. So have you guys done any co-sponsored events? Yes. What have you done? Tons. Well, we sponsor each other right. all the time. <laughs> um, like I go to the book arts thing. The pop-up museum comes to um, comes to the library. We uh, re they have a, there's a this great group, and I would love to know how they got their name. Maybe you know how they got their name. Researchers Anonymous. I know them. I don't, I don't get the anonymous part, but maybe that's what Nina can tell me. But um, when we're, we have another program called Snapshot Stories where we collect local, um, local photographs and we post them online so people can see photographs and we identify them and we catalog them and we do all of that kind of thing. A lot of times people think they have really a picture of Aunt Maud and actually or somebody from Researchers Anonymous say, yeah, but do you see you have that rare photograph of the roller coaster in the background and that's what they see and researchers anonymous help us a lot um, and they're a group who are affiliated with the museum so, of local so, history people uh, how is it that they're anonymous I don't know they I, I think it's I think it's to keep them from drinking you know and oh, um, yeah hi. I'm like uh, <laughs> Perks. I you know most of our partnerships are informal I would say and um, Certainly there have been times, and actually before I ever worked at the museum, one of the ways I first got involved in Santa Cruz was advocating when the library was going through a service model yeah. transformation. Um, but um, I think that we find that most of our partnerships at the MA are not um, written down in any clear way of saying, here's, you know, here is the agreement of what you're doing and what we're doing. It's mostly about starting to do things together and then knowing, hey, if I pick up the phone and call Janice, she's going to say yes, or we're going to find a way to work through this. And I, I know that, uh, I mean, it's about ultimately, especially in a small community, you end up building relationships. And um, I think we found we can never force fit people who can't work well together into a relationship with any kind of external structure of this collaboration must happen. But if people start to work together, uh, a lot can blossom from it. And um, and you get more ideas. Yeah. It just it just keeps rolling on and on and on. And there are things that we bring to each other that we pass on, and mm -hmm. you know it's fine. And uh, and it's just kind of like, hey, is there, you know, it's kind of in the neuronal net of Santa Cruz. We're just kind of looking for where are those synaptic links um, between us, or where is the link with somebody else for some other reason? Yeah. Who's the who's the best source? And there's no ego involved which is really nice, which is the best organization for either this material or this event or whatever it would be. Mm -hmm. But even, even smaller museums, we have an agricultural museum um, out in Watsonville. We connect with them. The San Lorenzo uh, Valley Museum is one person, and the hours for that museum are dependent on when she needs to get her grandchild to school and when she has to pick her up, but that's okay. We do lots of programs with them and we get to find out about the history in the valley. So I bet you have museums and organizations like that. We're doing this really um, interesting thing right now around citizen science and we're working with um, the Museum of Discovery for Children in Santa Cruz and the uh, Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. And every month, we bring in somebody different to talk about um, an, interest, uh, an interesting topic in science. And of course, there's no lack of them in California because you have the drought. In Santa Cruz, there's always marine animals. Um, there's birds, there's the condors down in Big Sur, there's backyard um, wildlife, all kinds of things that you can do. Um, just connecting with people like that, opening that door. Other questions? Yeah. How do you, sorry, how do you get the invitation? Oh, 
Thank you. How do you get the invitation out there, yeah. uh, especially with people who aren't necessarily on an internet connection yeah. kind of thing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, at least in our case, um, I'll say two things about that. One is we used to joke that it starts with nepotism. You know, you start by asking the people you know. And then um, what we've found over time, we've had a shift where at the museum at first, it was just when I came in, it, my number one message when I was talking to the press or anybody was, we are open for your ideas. We want to embrace Santa Cruz culture. You have an idea, bring it in here. It's on, you know, our website says that we, we just constantly reinforce bring it in. And what we found over time was, um, in the beginning, we really had to do um, a lot of cold calling and recruiting, um, and also just reaching out to people we knew to get involved. Now we found as the museum has become more prominent, there are more people volunteering themselves to us. And what that's meant is we want to say yes to those people, but it means that we're more strategic in focusing our outreach and recruiting to the people who are not raising their hands. And so we're really looking at, OK, who's who's coming to the table? Who, who do we feel like is part of our community but is not showing up in that way? And how do we reach out? And we've really found, at least again in a small community, it's about identifying key uh, people who are highly networked, and so whether that means in a given neighborhood or in a given artistic group, uh, practice or whatever it is, figuring out who's that person who's the right first person to contact. But we literally will, you know, if we're planning an event with a new kind of theme for us, um, we'll have a staff member who will do a bunch of Google searching and a bunch of cold calling and emailing you know, to a whole bunch of different groups or people or Facebook groups that might be related to something just to try and get some things out there. And we do track for our collaborators um, how many are new to the MA, because it's important to us that even as we're working with more people, that it doesn't become like we've made our tent bigger and now we close the doors behind those people. So we want to always have, you know, 50 plus percent of our collaborators be new collaborators so that we're constantly making sure that we're inviting new people in. So doing that mix of working with people who become known to us, who are easy, and then building relationships with new people. And um, if you talk to Nora, who runs all our Friday night festivals, um, maybe she can raise her hand. Um, she works with 50 to a couple hundred collaborators per month on a festival, and she spends a lot of her time meeting with people and talking with them about what it would be like to collaborate with us. And we have some rules we've kind of figured out, like you've got to have an in-person meeting before you collaborate with somebody, um, you know, setting some clear sense of what, what, um, what they're bringing, what you're bringing, that kind of thing. And um, she spends a lot of her time just building relationships in the community in that way. Um, so it starts with cold calling sometimes, and then also reaching out to the people you already know. <laughs> and with the public library, we've spent a lot of effort on our volunteer um, coordination office, and we've reached out. We've got volunteers from the community that have never volunteered for the library before, and we've basically what we did was um, hire people who have. We hired two people who have worked in the volunteer field for a very long time and knew how to go out and find those people. Because there's some people, as Nina said, that you will always see and will always volunteer and figure right away that maybe the library is a good place for them. But now we're finding all kinds of folks um, to help with the citizen science program I talked about or jail service or something like that in ways we never would have Found. So if you have whatever your volunteer coordination avenues are, take advantage of those. You'll find people. And if, and if you don't have them, right. I, can, I can talk to you about that, too. Other questions, other thoughts? Yeah, uh, two questions. One is, you talked about big changes. You spoke of big changes at uh, the museum. Did you do a, and I'm not saying you should have, yeah. a, a formal needs assessment or a strategic planning initiative? And then second question, sorry, that might oh, be a big no, one. Okay. So second one, um, well actually let's just stick with that. <laughs> you can put it out there, it's okay. No, no, no. Okay, um, well I'll say in our case, um, I would say sort of. So um, 
Uh, as you might guess from looking at me, um, I'm a fairly non-traditional pick for a museum director. Um, I, when I was hired, I remember saying to my husband, oh, it's going to be really hard for them to hire somebody with a two in the front of their age. Um, <laughs> you know, I was 29 when I was hired. And so, and I'd never, I'd always been an exhibit designer. I'd never um, managed anybody. I'd never done fundraising before. So I really decided, you know, there had been a question earlier about was I living in the community. So I'd really decided I didn't want to be on planes anymore. I really wanted to do this, and I believed in the museum. And they had a, a shockingly long hiring process, given how quickly they were running out of money. But, um, but I used that as an opportunity to really do my own needs assessment, basically. They also did this thing where the board was off limits to me. So I only had 990s. I only had public filings about the museum. But I went and spent a few months basically doing my own needs assessment, reaching out to community leaders, artists, um, politicians, different folks, and just saying, hey, what do you know about the museum? What can you tell me? You know, what do you think? Da, 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 da. And, um, and really getting a sense of what was going on and what wasn't, where the opportunity was. And so I actually, um, as part of kind of the application process, just sort of on my own initiative, wrote a three-year plan to say, hey, I know I've never done this before, and you might have some questions about that, so here's, what, here's my playbook. Here's what I will do if you hire me. And, um, and of course, I'll plan to course correct based on what I learned from you, but, um, but here's what I think we'll need to do. And we, were, we stayed shockingly close to that plan um, for the first couple of years. And so, um, and in some ways, you know, I'd been living in Santa Cruz and had had this kind of question mark always. Look, I, you know, my profession was always in museums, and here I, I had not been involved in that museum, and it almost was like there was a, uh, uh, well, I learned later there was a small group of people who knew and loved the museum, but as somebody who wasn't part of that group, it almost felt like it was a mystery what, what was going on there, and so um, there was a huge opportunity kind of to do a needs assessment actually outside of the museum, where if... I had had a lot of access inside. I might not have clearly identified as much the gap that existed as much as I did. And so in some ways, the fact that during this hiring process they had a, a closed wall um, in some ways made it easier for me to learn from families and artists and history-oriented people and things like that what they thought was missing. And so, um, I, so I guess I did do that, but not quite in the way that an organization typically would. And I'll also say that coming in at such a clear time of crisis that turnaround situation, and I feel like the leadership needed in that situation is very different than one that is in growth or maturity or kind of on rocky ground. So I think we all knew that I was being hired in a sink or swim situation of like, we're handing you the keys to this place, can you make this work or not? And if not, we're gonna close. And so I felt both the responsibility and the privilege to say, here's the direction, we're going in this direction from day one, we're not gonna take six months and figure out what's going on here, we're just, you know, we're just placing this bet and going. And um, I feel lucky that it worked out, but I was also ready to be fired if it didn't, you know? So I, I went in knowing that it was that high stakes kind of situation. And the library was lucky because it, we were going through a similar crisis and we also had a dramatic uh, service change. And before Nina got involved in the museum in the way she just described, she was actually coming and giving feedback and helping us think through our situation. So that it was a out as very, well, but. <laughs> no, but you oh, yeah. know, long run, it did though, honestly. Good, good, it I'm did. glad to hear it. Look, we're sitting yeah, here, Yeah, right? that's true, that's true, yeah. yeah, that's right. It didn't turn yeah. out so badly. No, that's right, that's but, right. Um, so we felt really lucky um, that we had her until she got really into the museum and had to do that work. So yeah, it worked out for both of us. Oh, it's nice of you to say. Yeah, I have a couple of questions, um, I, yeah. I just wanted to thank you. I think your, sure. your presentation was just really inspirational and there's a lot to, to gain from that. And it, it made me con think of, you know, the Pope is, Pope's visit to the US has been in so much of the news and something that he said about, um, that I really, thought about a lot is is that interest of you know um, that chaos is good and messy things mm -hmm. are good and it's and it's in that where we can grow a lot and change things and it seems like that part of what you're saying and and presenting sure. is you know we have to be comfortable with exper experimenting and um, you know seeing what works and revising and iterative, iterative 
iterative process. And yeah. so I, I think that's, I don't know if you, you know, yeah, and I don't think it will ever make it that. comforting, right? I think that um, one thing I've really learned from artists is a lot of artists will talk about um, uh, creative tension being a really positive thing. And this idea of, you know, instead of start trying to resolve a situation, how do you get something out of that friction um, in that situation? And so I think that that's true. Um, you know, I think also we've learned, as a lot of places have, that you can't have chaos for too long, um, and you have to have some kind of parameters around it. And uh, But I honestly, I really do think um, that um, I think the hardest place to be in and try and change is a place that is doing okay, that kind of sees some issues on the horizon, but there's not enough urgency to feel like we have the clarion focus, let's do it. And so I would always choose that high stress over that other situation. However, I think that there's a great opportunity for us to prevent getting into these high stress loops by, by being ready to embrace those fears and those possibilities before they, you know, come to us with that level of urgency. So that's something I wonder about a lot is kind of how do we um, get the positive side of that urgency without the, you know, pretty extreme um, downsides that come with it as well and, and, um, and whether that's possible. Um, I don't know how you feel I'm about I'm in that. the middle right now, so yeah. don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have faith that this will um, end and we'll move forward, yeah. <laughs> I will say there's a really great book um, called Nonprofit Life Cycles by Susan Kenny Stevens, and she um, really chronicles kind of the different phases that a nonprofit will go through, and it's not just true of nonprofits, but um, she's very explicit about, you know, when you're in a growth mode, here's what leadership looks like then. If you're in a maturity mode, here's what it looks like then. If you're in a turnaround, here's what that looks like. And um, I've found it very helpful, um, both at the Ma and also like organizations that I help out with in just as we think about diagnosing, okay, you know, where are we and, and what do we need right now and how are things changing and how should we change because of that? But it is exciting, I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> Did you have a question or a comment? Yeah. Good morning. Um, I just appreciated your comment as far as you taking the initiative to do some type of strategic alignment. Mm. Basically, um, one of the things that my colleague and I, we're both from rural libraries, she's from San Benito, I'm from Kings County, and I really appreciated that we, as if it's museums or libraries, that we do take different approaches. Yeah. When I decided to do a strategic alignment, I actually did what was called uh, through Joan Fry Williams and George Needham, which is called a strategic, strategic reality check, huh. because I chose and selected not to do the formal process as far as getting a direction, as far as how we're going to collaborate. Whereas my colleague here, who is from San Benito County, she did a more traditional approach, uh -huh. but however, she uh, was able to uh, ascertain a consultant from her community and had services for free. So I really do appreciate that some uh, uh, organization, uh, it sounds like you're small, yeah. unlike ourselves, yeah. but we still took the initiative and the approaches are different and I do really appreciate you sharing that today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. We actually ended up, um, not so much as a planning process, but kind of as a, we called it naming and claiming. Once we were a few years in, we decided, okay, let's create some strategic document that kind of says what we're about, so that as new people are coming in, you know, we can kind of um, put some roots under this. And we used a process um, that kind of comes from activist world um, called theory of change, where it's like, how do you connect the activities you do to the change you seek in your community? And so we now have this one pager, um, I'd be happy to show it to somebody on my computer later, That's um, or, or we'll share it digitally. Um, it's just a, it's a graphic we worked with an artist on that is just kind of a one-page playbook of how is the work that we're doing leading us to building a stronger, more connected community. And for us, you know, there are some things we do multi-year plans for and things, but um, for us, kind of making sure that everybody at the end of the day is speaking the same language, is ending up at the same goal, man, you want that document to be as short as possible. You know, you want people to be able to tattoo it on their foreheads as they're thinking about what they're doing during the day. So I think having those different types and those different levels is really important. Yeah. Um, hi, this is great. Uh, 
So let's say you're in a situation where they don't really want you to take risks, yeah. and, but yet you have this ability to start doing some things maybe outside the box. Not that I think I'm going to fail, yeah. but I'm, taking, I'm in an organization that's not big risk taker. So yeah. do you have any tips to um, when I do fail of ways <laughs> I can make it so that they will let me yeah. continue taking risks? Sure. Yeah, what a great question. Um, well, first of all, it sounds like you already feel like you kind of have a little bit of that space, which is the most important starting point, to feel like you have that space. Um, so uh, my background's in electrical engineering. That's where my degree is from. And so I'm really big on this idea that everything is a problem that you're failing on the way to solving. And um, I don't even really, the fail word doesn't really come into my vocabulary in terms of thinking about you're constantly prototyping and testing. And so one thing I'd suggest is thinking about, is there a way you could do an A to B test, where you're trying two different versions of something to learn which one is more successful? So the, the secret part of that is that means one of them is failing, uh, but it means that instead you're positioning it around which one of these works better, you know? Or, um, and so if it's, I mean, certainly, um, let's say it's programmatic and you say, okay, I'm gonna try doing this on a Friday night and I'm gonna try doing it on a Sunday afternoon and we're gonna, we're testing with the time slots. One of those is gonna be a fail, um, or ra rather relatively one of them's gonna be better, right? So is there a way you can con con uh, construct it as an experiment so that the concept is we're learning from this rather than did this succeed or not? Um, and then the other thing I'd just say is if you feel like you have even a little bit of room I always say, you know, your best strategic weapon is your mission statement. Every institution has a mission statement. There's probably something in your mission statement you can hook what you want to try onto. And so I feel like it's like those, you know, third grade diagramming sentences. Like, is there a way you can say, oh, it will fulfill X part of our mission if we try doing Y? And you like just use it as strategic armor. I mean, when I first came, um, I knew that we were going to radically change the museum, but they had already written this vision statement saying they wanted to be a thriving central gathering place. And there are more words to the vision statement, but I just honed in on that and I was like, all right, that is my armor for trying some of these things and for them being able to say back to people, oh, I'm fulfilling this thing that is in the thing that you wrote as your strategic vision. I'm, I'm hired by you to do that and I'm going to do that. And so, if there's some strategic language you can use, uh, I find that any institution, whether they use their mission statement actively or not, some part of them knows they have to attend to it, you know, because somebody ratified it sometime. So if you can use that language to your power, um, then people may not want to listen to you, but they kind of feel like they have to. So I find that that's also pretty helpful. So finding a way to construe it as an experiment, um, and then using your mission as strategic language. And then, you know, you already started doing this, but I always think about Audre Lorde saying, you know, um, you know, self-protection is not about preservation, it's a political act, and, you know, take care of yourself as you're doing it. You know, find a way to feel psyched about it. I know one place where they created these failure cards, which are like coffee 10 stamp cards, where it's like, you know, how, who can fail the most here, you know? And your institution may not be there yet, but, you know, can you create a way for yourself, whether it's constructing it as a game or having a buddy who you're doing it with too, and you guys are both pushing yourselves, you know, but finding a way to, to make sure that you're emotionally protecting yourself, taking care of yourself as you're doing it, I think is important too. Yeah, that's great advice. I would spend a lot of time on your framework so that you have it in your head and then um, go for it. And then just don't look back. Yeah. Just go. Yeah. She's going to look back. Hi, um, uh, working in the libraries as a public institution and then working um, in museums serving the public, how do you, have you effectively engaged uh, public opinion on your programs mm -hmm. and services? Do you want to talk to that first? Um, we don't seem to have any problem getting public <laughs> on, our, on our services. I never, uh, we do make it, uh, we, we do make it formal. Sometimes we do a focus group. Sometimes we ask survey questions. Um, a lot of times people come in and volunteer it. We, we really encourage interaction with us on social media, Facebook, 
we have Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and our guru is right here. I saw her earlier, but I don't know where she is. Right, at, right there, right there. There is the, the library guru from social media. This is not news to you, Jasmine. Don't pretend that it is. <laughs> Um, so she finds all kinds of ways to get interaction, and that way we get a lot of feedback. That way people don't hesitate to jump in and uh, let us know what they think. But they will walk into all of our branches, and we have lots of branch staff here who will attest to that. So, um, but we have, uh, for certain things like strategic plans, pres annual reports, presentations to boards, we do make we do uh, make it formal in all kinds of ways. Yeah, we've actually um, been on a pretty big push for um, more data and research, and we use this um, phrase "measurement that moves." We want to measure things that are going to change what we do, and so. Um, we have a lot of informal ways that people share with us how they feel, but we've started over the last year doing more intense um, audience surveying, which first started, frankly, one of the hardest things was really learning how to take a good kit sample and you know, knowing that you really have to pick random people and it can't be based on who walks up to you, it can't be based on who you're comfortable talking with. So that whole element of just learning how to survey, um, especially in a free public environment, um, was really rigorous and interesting for us to work on. And then what we've done is we've kind of decided that, as mentioning our theory of change earlier, so we basically have a strategic goal, um, unsurprisingly based on what you heard this morning, you know, our impact statement we care about, what we're trying to do at the end of the day is build a stronger and more connected community. And we see people being empowered, throwing into that, and then people bridging, going into that. And so we don't measure kind of how much do people like programming. We measure how much are people on the track to being empowered and how much are people on the track to bridging. And so, for example, um, some of those things mean very typical kinds of measurements. Like for bridging, if we're going to say that our audience is reflective of the diversity of our community, we've got to know demographics of people. So we do demographic research on um, age, income, ethnicity, um, and what part of the county you live in as well. And then, but then a lot of the things we ask are questions that really get to, you know, on the path to empowerment are questions like, um, did you feel welcomed um, and included in the space? Or um, did you leave here inspired with an idea of how you'll be creative in your own life? Or on the bridging side, we'll ask, um, did you have a meaningful interaction with a stranger at the museum? Or did you learn about um, a form of art or culture that was new to you? So try trying to really look very specifically at things that are on those strategic things. Um, I'll also say that we focus a lot on people who are not coming to the museum and thinking not just about what's happening for our audience, but who are those people out there who we want to engage with and where are they at. Um, when we were just starting the Latino engagement work, we actually for the first time hired out um, a research firm that did an ethnographic study about um, Latino, um, it was very specifically focused on um, kind of Latino families' um, decision making around leisure time. We weren't really interested in whether or talking about the museum. We were really interested in the question of how do you decide what you're going to do on the weekend? Who's part of that decision? What come? What factors come into it? And so we worked with a research firm to get this really front end research just to start to understand some things um, about uh, kind of attitudinal preferences. And that ended up really shifting some of our programming. So for example, we heard a lot um, you know, you were talking earlier about chaos organizationally. Um, we, we've always had very chaotic programming, and um, we've had a lot of concern about how do you on-ramp people into a place where it's like, they're making book sculptures over here, and they're, you know, making giant flowers over there, and there's a band, and there's all these different things going on. Um, one of the things we heard, actually, from that study was there was a real desire for chaotic programming, um, and that we heard from a lot of families who said, you know, you go to a white event and like it's all scheduled and one thing happens after another and you feel like you don't want to leave because you might offend somebody. And But our events, everything's going on at the same time and you can come in and out. And we were like, oh, sweet, we are that way. Let's market that, you know? Um, versus things where we learned, um, for example, about, you know, huge focus on food at events or outdoor events that really shifted some of our thinking about where and how we should be programming. So that's the only time so far that we've really done that kind of more, you know, highly front end, like just straight like market research, but it was very useful. And um, I think that there are other ways I could imagine us doing that kind of research in the future too. Yeah. 
some questions yeah, over here. You said at the uh, beginning that you had one week left of cash. Yeah. How did you manage to meet payroll, and how did you survive that time period? <laughs> yeah. So, right. So, okay. So we had... Um, $16,000 in the bank, we had $37,000 in unpaid bills, and we had about a $60,000 payroll at the time. Um, and so right away, days one and two, layoffs, and we all took a salary cut. So again, no unions here. Um, we had a bunch of people who were on different furloughs, and I just said, look, everybody, including myself, we're all going to take a 20% salary cut. When we get $50,000 in the bank, we'll go to 10%. When we have $100,000 in the bank, we'll go to full salaries. You can work 80% time. You can work 100% time. I'm going to be here every day. You do whatever you need to do. Um, but we're all in this together. So the, the less glamorous side of shift is cuts. Cuts first. Um, so cuts first, and then at the same time, I went out to all of our, and granted, I had never done fundraising before. I went out to all of our longtime donors, and I said, um, we are going to, I, I personally feel the museum's been under-delivering on our public value. We're going to over-deliver, and I need you to buy in now. And I remember sitting in my house, practicing in the bathroom, saying to the mirror, I would like to ask you to commit to $10,000 and like trying to get through that sentence without <laughs> laughing. And, um, but I had a lot of those conversations. And so, um, so it was a mixture of cuts and fundraising and just trying to get, I, I tried right away, we didn't have any debt, which I've learned now is a great thing. So it was like, let's just get income ahead of expenses a few days at a time, a week at a time, two weeks at a time. So we were just trying to get in the black so we weren't putting any money into a hole. And um, so we could, everything that we raised or everything that we cut was leading us in the right direction. And you know, hugely fortuitously, I started in May in, uh, and we did that right away. And in October, we went to 10% cuts. And by the end of the year, so I think it took a little under six months to get to full salaries. And Stacy, when were you hired? Uh, to work. Yeah. Uh, to work in January. Yeah, so January of that, so eight months later, we hired our first um, next staff member. So we were able to turn ourselves around pretty quickly, fortunately. Yeah. Huh? Well, um, I had a question. Um, so you said that you had triple attendance, and well, that's a that's a that's a great accomplishment. Um, and but uh, and that you were also performing really well in 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 your attendance according to income distribution. Yeah. But I do understand, like from most of my experiences, that a museum is kind of a rich mm, place. K kind of, yeah, there's a kind of a financial barrier to entry. Sure. Yeah. So I was just curious as to how you addressed that while the, the income distribution thing, while, you know, with, uh, um, balancing that with the museum sort of en basic entry. Sure. Thing. Yeah, great question. Um, well, so first of all, let, I fully acknowledge like museums are traditionally perceived as white, wealthy, educated spaces, period. And if we are going to include more people in them, we have to kind of acknowledge that and break down what, what that means culturally and, uh, and open it up. Um, one of the things, so our museum costs $5 to enter, um, but uh, about 70% of our visitors come for free, either on a free day or we have this policy we call spontaneous free. I actually learned this from a librarian. Um, I remember a librarian a long time ago, he said to me, the best way I can make a library patron for life is to waive your fees. If you come in with a book that's overdue, <laughs> and <laughs> Eli Newberger, I'm sure many know him, he's from Ann Arbor, he said, you know, if you bring in a book that's overdue and you're nervous, and I can say to you, don't worry about it, we are building a relationship that's different. And I took that and I thought, wow, how could we apply this in a museum? And so we have a policy called spontaneous free, where a lot of people walk in and they kind of look around and you can tell they're kind of like assessing, like, do I want to come in here? And maybe it's not even a financial assessment, maybe it's about time, whatever. Always those people we say, hey, is this your first time here? Come on in, be my guest. Um, and so we have a very open policy in that regard. Now, well, I will say one of the things we learned from audience research, which was very surprising, um, we have two Friday night festivals per month. One is free um, on first Fridays, and one costs $5 on third Fridays. And we were very surprised to learn that our audience for third Fridays, the one that costs $5, is more income diverse and more low income by percentage than first Fridays. And um, that 
that really sh surprised us because we felt like, wow, why isn't the free night the night that is, um, you know, more um, more lower income people coming? And the answer is First Friday is a um, kind of community-wide like art walk night where people kind of think of it as a night where you go out, you look at some art, you drink some wine. It, it has a cultural bias towards a more affluent group who are coming and doing a downtown thing. Versus if you're coming for Radical Craft Night or you're coming for the Growth Festival or Adventure or any of our Third Friday festivals, um, we've recruited collaborators from across our community. You're probably coming because you know one or more of those collaborators or you're interested in that topic. The value is way more than $5, but you're willing to pay the $5, and, it's, and we're, we are actually recruiting an audience that is more income diverse than the audience that is already there for First Friday. So we have a lot of, I have a lot of questions about that whole question of should we be free, should we not be free, you know, and just how does price bear into these things? And I think that there's plenty of research, at least in museums, that shows if you make the museum free, more people will come, but they'll actually be more of the same kind of people who are already coming, who already felt the museum was a place for them. And that if you're really trying to engage people who may not feel like a museum is a place for them, I'm sure this is true for libraries, it's not just about opening the, the doors wider, it's about actually doing something different to recruit and include and involve those people. Um, yeah. Can I ask a follow-up to that sure. So yeah, so when we made this commitment to do deeper surveying, we decided, okay, we want to do this for real. And so we um, started, we recruited a group of, actually in our case, they were volunteers, um, UC Santa Cruz students mostly. They call themselves the Beta Datas. So they are our survey task force group. And, um, and they got very rigorously trained in how do you get an accurate sample. And basically the way they do it is it's in every a number of people. So if it's a really busy event, it's every fifth person. If it's less busy, it's every third person or every other person. But that they just have a rule about which people they have to approach to ask to survey. And then we make the surveys as short as possible so it's as easy as possible for somebody to say yes to do it. Um, but the most important thing is getting a real sample. Um, and so we, even though we know we could have probably more surveys come in and we'd love to make it like there's an engagement station that also has a survey, we know that that's going to be volunteer based and it's just not going to be as rigorous as getting a real sample. So that's the most important part and, and that was worth investing the time in to figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nina, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so it's amazing what you did with like very little money. And uh, so we were just, I was just wondering, wanted to pick your brain. What do you think is the biggest barrier to public libraries? Just think of them as in general, not like Santa Cruz or yeah, San yeah. Francisco. Okay. But what do you think would be a good starting point for us to open it up? and? So let me just say that I, uh, I started off my talk saying how much respect I have. And I really feel like. Um, I, I, I love libraries, and I think it's one of the reasons I might actually be a, a, where I feel, I like working in museums because I don't love museums. I feel like, ah, oh, there's so much we have to fix. Whereas I'm one of those like nostalgic library users who's annoying, um, but, um, <laughs> But I will say that one of the things, we were talking about this in the car on the way up, um, I have been surprised at the extent to which um, I feel like the library has gotten easier and easier for me to use transactionally, which is in some ways very positive, right? I, my mom taught me this. She's from LA. You know, she's like, you know, you can check, you can reserve the books on, you know, I reserve my books online. I go to the library to pick them up. I self-check out. And, but I am concerned that that's a very frictionless and a very, uh, it's, I don't necessarily need more humans in that chain, but I do feel like I'm somebody who loves the library and my only real access point is very transactional, um, except for obviously the collaboration we do. So I'm really curious about this question of um, libraries as community centers and, and putting that branding more explicitly out. Look, in museums, we have a huge barrier that you guys don't have, which is we have this weird fixation on this professional amateur divide, right? We are so fixated in museums on like what art belongs in and what art belongs out. Whereas every public librarian I know says, you want to read Danielle Steele? Great. You want to read, you know, Foucault? Great. We are excited about you being part of this. Like, there already is such an inclusive community perspective. You're not gonna have, or maybe you do, I don't know. A lot of people snipe at me about, is this a museum or a community center? It's like, it's both, get over it, you know? Um, but I think for a library, you don't, uh, you have such an opportunity to just totally own that space. And, um, and I think also, 
libraries, like museums, there are so many preconceptions people have about what they are and who they're for, and we've got to find ways to very overtly, very explicitly break those preconceptions, um, because otherwise we're just going to keep being killed by what people think about something that is not for them. You know, I always say um, museums are like church. Um, nobody goes anymore, but they don't want it to change. Um, they want it to be exactly like it was when they didn't, when, before they you know, decided they didn't want to go anymore. And I feel like there's a potential with libraries similarly to say, man, like, what is the best possible experience we could create in this community? And um, how can we just unapologetically um, do that and be that from a community center perspective? Because I really believe um, in this Robert Putnam theory about bridging and this fact that we have fewer and fewer spaces to be with people who are different from us, from different economic backgrounds, different racial backgrounds, different perspectives. And if we can tap into that opportunity, whether as museums, libraries, community centers, whatever, we can make our communities so much more vibrant and so much more successful. Um, there was a great New York Times article recently about you know, libraries doing tool lending, instrument lending, and, and one of the things that really struck me about it is how, especially we know this in the Bay Area, the sharing economy is in some ways such this thin veneer of like fuzzy BS over this deeply exploitative market economy thing going on. But libraries could be these places where it's like, no, sharing is this beautiful thing that we do as communities, and, um, and we're gonna own that. So anyway, I, that's, I feel like there's an opportunity to, to move. Um, I, I think it's already happening programmatically, so I think it's more about overtly, loudly being those community spaces and making sure that those people who are becoming transactional users, um, maybe they're not hooked in, you know, maybe they're not talking to a person when they check out a book, but there are a lot of other reasons, community reasons, that they're using and involved with the library. And I, I think there's huge opportunity for that. I'm sure many of you guys are doing that. Um, so um, that's my non-knowledgeable perspective. <laughs> Very knowledgeable. <laughs> Sorry, we only have time for one more question here. Let's start down here. How do you uh, keep from being overwhelmed and stressed <laughs> out? And also, how do you, how do you maintain your uh, energy and positivity? I'm often overwhelmed and stressed out. Um, I. Uh, I was once told that the one thing that a leader needs to bring is energy, that everybody, if you're the leader of an organization, everybody keys off your energy, and if you are not engaged, then they are not going to be engaged, and you don't have the, the, you don't get the right to show up without energy as a leader any day, any time. And it's like, it's one of those, you know, crosses to bear. <laughs> and um, so I believe that, but, um, but look, Yes, it's easy to be overwhelmed and frustrated, but look at all the things we can do for our communities. I mean, it's so beautiful. Like, um, I guess I feel like there are so many reasons for me to be inspired, and there are so many jerks who just get me more fired up, too. So um, I think that, um, especially when people are overtly discriminatory, it's so easy to be like, oh, we're going to crush you, you know, and we're going to make this <laughs> awesome. And uh, um, I don't know, I think it's just, I think, you know, I often feel like, I don't know how much this comes up in libraries, but I really feel in museums that we don't embrace the extent to which some of this work is activist work, and that we have to bring that kind of political agency and energy to the work. And there are other ways to do the work too, but that's how I choose to do the work, and, um, and so, you know, that's the fire that's inside of me to do it. Um, I feel like if I was just getting a paycheck and doing a job, I wouldn't be nearly as engaged or as energetic. What about you, Janice? You have a ton of energy, I feel like. Um, I, I do see uh, being a public librarian as um, when it, having, being able to have a job where you can contribute to the community and be part of social action, part of community service, and that's why I was attracted to being a public librarian and has stayed that way my entire career. So I have the same feeling, it's a chance to make a difference, it's a chance to be part of the community and not very many people get to have a job where that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you guys. Thank you, Nina and Janice. That was an epic Q&A session, epic.